The United States' most identifying trait is that it's the world's most ethnically diverse and multicultural nation. Every day is a celebration of ethnic and cultural pride and political accomplishments that reflect on a group's sense of identity and projected political empowerment. As early as 1850, the first migration of Cape Verdeans joined a smorgasbord of immigrants from around the world who came to America looking for a better life. The result, a multicultural ethnic stew where in theory each ingredient retains its integrity and flavor while helping to yield a successful final product. These pioneer Afro-Portuguese seafarers would begin a legacy of settling into a new life filled with hope, yet coping with separation, homesickness, and longing for saudade. This expression of longing felt by generations of Cape Verdeans is the tie that binds this present day community to their ancestral homelands, language, music, food, and cultural traditions. The Afro-Portuguese settlers, although small in numbers, to this day strive to maintain their robust flavor in the melting pot we call America. Our story begins in the Cape Verde Islands and Acapulego, located in the North Atlantic Ocean, just off the west coast of Africa. The landscapes and mountain tops of Brava, São Nicolau, and Santiago. The volcano of Fogo, Santo Antão, and San Vicente. Sandy shorelines of Sal, Boa Vista, and Mayu. Their cities, villages, and ports give us a glimpse of present day Cape Verde. These islands were colonized by the Portuguese in the 15th century. Enslaved Africans were brought to the islands to work on Portuguese plantations. The less fortunate became part of the slave trade as they were transported to the U.S. and other parts of the world. This event would mark the first experience of migration for Cape Verdeans as many escaped to Dakar, a nearby West African destination. For the next 500 years, Cape Verde was plagued by recurring drought, subsequent famine, and epidemics of yellow fever and smallpox. These conditions, along with colonial Portuguese mismanagement of the land, meant that it was very difficult to survive. These events mark the beginning of a story of transnational migration and the resilience of a Cape Verdean identity and pride for generations to come. Cape Verdeans migrated to other places like Africa, South America, Europe, Asia, and North America in search of a better life. Cape Verdeans 
were attracted to this country or introduced to this country because of the whaling ships. The whaling ships from, from New Bedford would leave with uh, half a crew and stop in the Azores and Cape Verde and sign on to the, you know, sign on new whalers. But the American ships would go there, pick up Cape Verdean whalers and come back. My great uncle, John T. Gonzalez, set his career as a cabin boy, worked his way up through the ranks and became a captain. But because of the whaling, the ships going back and forth, some of the men settled here. Starting after 1860 or so, more of the ships started coming in, bringing women. So with the influx of women, you have a community developing in New Bedford, the first Cape Verdean community in America. They became owners of the means of their transportation here uh, to the U.S. So you had a situation where uh, prior, when in the 19th and early 20th century, you had Cape Verdeans who had worked on the whaling ships, uh, having the ability to then, in the 20th century, uh, purchase these, these ships that were involved in a cargo trade between uh, the West African coast and, and the East Coast of the United States. They are perhaps a, a very unique case of immigrant groups having the ability to own the means of their own transport here to the United States. In fact, the arrival of a packet boat was a big event in the Cape Verdean community. It would get announced in the local paper and people would go down to the dock and there'd be music and as soon as the boat arrived, they would uh, climb on board and greet each other. And this is a group of immigrants coming at the late 19th and early 20th century, when, which we call the big second wave of migration. This is the time when um, you see large numbers of Southern and Eastern European immigrants making their home in the United States, Italians, Jewish, Polish. When those people arrived in the U.S., there was no sense of Cape Verde. They were people from a particular island within Portugal. So you're Brava from Portugal. You're from Santo Antone in Portugal, just like the people in the Azores are from Fayal in Portugal, that sort of thing. So they, and the one thing that bound them was, was uh, this common Portuguese language and culture and ancestry, that sort of thing. So then you lead up to 1975 and you've got, you've got the uh, revolution brewing over there for 20 years. And then over here, you've got the civil rights movement. We have our experience. So this is consciousness of at least if you're not black, you're just not Portuguese but you're always Cape Verdean now. Everybody's Cape Verdean on both sides. And then what happens after independence, you have nationalism, there's, there's a country to identify with. Making the connection, the link between uh, the motherland and the community here in uh, Massachusetts uh, certainly has uh, brought it full circle to me and given me a perspective, I believe, on uh, Cape Verdeans and the Cape Verdean culture uh, about its uniqueness. Most of us know we're the small town kid who finds ourselves bouncing around the world and growing up pretty quickly and then reflecting back on the fact that our grandparents did the same thing to get here. I mean, it's, it's an interesting circle. Uh, I really started to appreciate how bold uh, grandparents or for some people parents or great grandparents were to get in those little ships and come across the Atlantic to take a chance as to what was happening. Antonio José Andrade left the island of Brava, Cape Verde in 1914 for New Bedford, Massachusetts, leaving his new bride, Maria Dushresh, behind. The typical practice among Cape Verdean men was to leave the islands for the United States the first chance they got. Dias na barco é muito comprido. Na América, um tachacheu oportunidade. Um dia ando volta para trás para Cabo Verde. E a hora que me voltando de levar o comigo para um mundo não. Me te levar o comigo, minha amor. During the big immigration push at the turn of the century, a number of Cape Verdeans made their way to various destinations in the United States in hopes of improving their lives. This particular chapter in their unique legacy focuses on their westward trek to California. Westward migration to California is documented at around 1848 at the time of the California Gold Rush. 
Primarily Cape Verdean men in search of work made the arduous journey to the Golden State via whaling ships bound for Hawaii. On wagon trains, stagecoaches, river boats, the Pony Express, and the first transcontinental railroad. In the mid to late 1800s, the production of whale oil created many jobs for Cape Verdeans. As a result, early settlements of Cape Verdeans were evidenced in Bakersfield, Fresno, Sacramento, and San Diego. At the turn of the century, when the whaling industry started showing signs of decline, railroad, construction, agriculture, and dairy industries grew. Cape Verdeans were employed on and owned dairy farms in Northern California. In the wake of disaster, there was hope. After the great 1906 San Francisco earthquake and fire, Thousands of immigrants, including Cape Verdeans, flocked to the city by the bay, hoping to find employment in its reconstruction. One of the most illustrious Cape Verdeans of the 20th century was Mersolini di Grassa, better known to his followers as Sweet Daddy Grace, founder and first bishop of the United House of Prayer for all people. The flamboyant bishop was an effective evangelist who preached revival in a Pentecostal tradition that included public baptisms such as this one in Oakland in 1915. Past and present day Cape Verdeans are primarily Roman Catholics, an affiliation that dates back to its colonial relationship with Portugal. Often recognized as a deeply religious group, Cape Verdeans continue to celebrate holidays with traditional festivals such as the Feast of St. John. Antonio Andrade left New Bedford for California, where he worked as a cook on passenger ships sailing between San Francisco and Hawaii until he joined the Army in 1918. He served at Fort Lewis, Washington until discharged in 1919. Antonio went to the Bay Area and worked for the California Transportation Company Riverboats that traveled between San Francisco and Sacramento, including the ships pride of the river, and the capital city. Most of his fellow crewmen in the galley were Cape Verdeans. Eventually, Antonio landed a job with the Southern Pacific Railroad. Well, my grandfather, when he first got in, he established himself here at the ports. He would get, I believe it was Alfred Monkine and a few other people, get them jobs working on the ships. And then from there, he went to work at the railroad. And then all the Creoles that come over, he got them on jobs at the railroad. Then he was friends with Sam, that owned Sam's Hoff Bra, Ranch Wagons. He got the other Creoles, the younger set, when they come over to the country, jobs at working at the restaurant. And then him and Andy Senna were instrumental in getting a lot of Creoles jobs and working for the city. Cape Verdeans and members found work with the Southern Pacific Railroad in Sacramento in the 1920s making it the largest Cape Verdean colony in California. Outside the home, pioneering Cape Verdean women also made their mark in the workplace as factory workers and owners of boarding houses that would become significant places of transition for the newly arrived and a thriving connection to familiar language, music, and cultural practices. In past years, you know, I worked in the canneries and and uh, later on, uh, I went to work for Campbell Soup. And then, I guess about a year, maybe not even a year, I went down into the filling department, which is filling the cans with the soup, running it through. There was this uh, uh, Mary Fernandez, was her name, and uh, she had this uh, boarding house. And, you know, a lot of people would come there. Mary Lundstein's house was uh, Fifth and S Street, which when my dad came to from from Jarafogo, uh, Mustero, 
he stayed at Mary Lundine's house, and Mary Lundine's house was the tracking point to family. So I still remember the conversation with my mother. She was like, are you sure you want to go to the United States? And you, are you sure you want to go and study? And, and to me, it was, it, was, it was almost, it was clear in my mind that that's what I wanted to do. It was an easy choice for me. Just because my older sister, my older brother, they were already here studying and they were going to UConn, uh, so University of Connecticut. I've always known that I was doing something special that not everybody in the world can do that, just get on a plane and come to the United States. Wherever they went, Cape Verdeans imported their whole culture with them. This system of shared beliefs and customs is what most Cape Verdeans have used to interpret the world and pattern their behavior. Transnational identity or the preservation of their culture has been a constant through the ages while at the same time interacting and adapting with their new surroundings, enduring feelings of soldadi or longing for their cultural heritage fuels their ability to maintain their identity and keeps Cape Verdeans, whether living in the U.S. or abroad, connected. This cultural connection has made these ancestral Cape Verdeans link through time with their contemporary counterparts. Therefore, the benefit of their bittersweet legacy of migration is how modern-day California Cape Verdeans keep these identifying cultural practices alive. Through small gatherings at homes of fellow Cape Verdeans, they would share traditional favorites on any given day. Jagasida, a flavorful dish of beans and rice, or canja de galinha, a dish of chicken, rice, and tomatoes. Music infiltrated these impromptu kitchen gatherings, creating festive events that the older generation would later refer to as kitchen dances, in which couples wrapped arm in arm were moving to a meditative beat of the coladera, or to the rapid swing of funana rhythms. Consequently, these homemade events would evoke strong memories of childhood that led to endless hours of storytelling and laughter that would be retold by each generation to follow. Smarna is dance, it's poetry, and it's music. And the coladera has its own style of dancing, although it changes from and from pe people that dance here in the U.S. The people, the way they dance coladera in California is different than they dance coladera in East Coast. The way they dance coladera in Europe is a little bit different than they, use, they do it in different places. So the different styles of uh, influence of the dance of the same music depend where you live. Although there is a pasada movement coming from Angola that most Cape Verdeans are dancing coladera on the pasada style, which is a uh, style of dance of uh, how the Angolans dance, the samba, which is an Angolan national music. Uh, you have Bandera has its own uh, dancing style. You have Funana, which has its very, very unique dancing style, which is exactly the same way that uh, Santo Domingo danced the merengues, you know. We have the mazurka dancing style, which is very S1, and only the old folks know that. Yeah, I don't touch mazurka. I don't touch mazurka. You know? Just a two-step to the side, I can yeah. never get it right. <laughs> <laughs> I would say very, very close to, to the love that I have for my singing, and that is cooking. I love to cook since I was a little girl. I always cooked with my mom. I was always in the kitchen. Whatever she did, I wanted to know how she did it, uh, what ingredients she put in it, and it, and it was always Cape Verdean food. Yo, what up? It's your boy Dwayne The Rock. We in the studio. We getting it in right now. Say what's up. Yeah. Yeah. Bethany is in the building. My grandmother, Conja Forts, she gave me that ability to cook, that stardom in that kitchen at four years old, teaching me how to make manchu, standing over her, actually pouring the beans in the pot, you know, trying to like do too much. And of course, you know, my grandma was old school, so if you think you even touching the pot without washing your hands, you get smacked, thrown off the chair, you getting butt whipping, all that stuff, because they want to teach you that you got to be very respectful 
to the chef. The best time uh, for me to spend with my mom and how she recalled the first time that she was making the cachupa. And here I was with her uh, making this cachupa, which I will never forget. Jagasita, there's kufungs, there's couscous, there's manjaka, there's pastel. You know, there's that bucky that we that we be flipping and, and getting creative. You know, we got that from the Portuguese. Portuguese throw it back to us. We put a little bit in there. We actually, you know, we're throwing jag with the bucky and trying to just get creative. The great task that I had was, well, how am I going to cook this perfectly every time I cook it? Uh, because I don't have recipes to go by. And towards uh, the last years, I actually convinced my mom to sort of write down some of the ingredients in the cooking put a little bit of flour here and then you put like three eggs and then you put a little pinch of salt and, and but i still needed more information than that and so i found that the best way to learn how to cook a kefirian dish was to actually stand there with my mom watch her do it and then from there i knew the next time i would cook the dish that i would do it right Caverd being a, a society which was formed by, by many different ethnic and racial groups right from birth, you know, all these different ethnic groups brought in their own musical heritage. The Africans bring in their, you know, what we see today as the Batuk, the Tabanka, you know, maybe the Funana and some other jazz that possibly, you, know. you hear it, despite the fact that it was banned and you couldn't play it, you know, we, we, we kept it. Obviously, today we have Marna, Batuk, Tabanka, Banderas. Bandera also, which is gone back as far as it's probably 1400s, 1500s, Correct. in implementation of the, this implementation of the, of the Christianity. So you, you, you look at the Marna, Batuk, Tabanka, Coladera, uh, Mazuka, which became ours. We have a very big tradition of dances and, you know, baptisms and all kind of family events all around music. Music is part of that. So music has been kind of a unifying force that has kept us together, has kept, uh, you know, the culture together. Portuguese has been recognized as the official language in Cape Verde. However, Criolo a mixture of Portuguese and West African language is spoken across all the islands. Contemporary linguistic scholars recognize the language as a major force in keeping the communication alive between Cape Verdeans in the U.S. and abroad. In the diaspora, Criolo plays an enormous role because it is the language that survives in the diaspora. I don't think it is the Portuguese language that survives. Although we speak both Creole and, and Portuguese in Cape Verde, the language that you find spoken in the diaspora, such, such as the Netherlands, for example, is Creole. And likewise, in the US, or I think any other Cape Verdean diaspora, probably with the exception of Portugal, where obviously Portuguese is the language. Creole is what unites us in the diaspora. Our Creole is mainly a mixture of uh, the Portuguese language and the many African languages that were used among the enslaved people in Africa. Creole originated as a language of need for communication between the Portuguese speakers who were probably the colonizers and the uh, slaves. So it was actually what we call a lingua franca, a language that originated for the purposes of communication. The ability to tell your story in your own voice and of your community is one of the prerogatives which has rarely been given to people of color in the diaspora. What we're doing now in documenting our history is critical because those of us who are second and third generation, we're the last link to the first generation who lived that experience of immigration. And if we don't take 
the responsibility and the initiative to inscribe our memory and our culture and our history and our voice, then all of that is lost for the generations that come after us. This whole down from uh, V Street all the way down to T Street were nothing but Cape Verdeans. We had a pool hall down the street. Uh, there was three of us that were uh, raised together, which was Leah Pina and Kathy Gomes. They were living from 3rd Street, 4th Street, on 5th Street, even on the 6th Street, all Cape Verdean. I think there's an element of kinship in the idea of Cape Verdean culture, so that you feel this connection with a, another Cape Verdean that you may not even know, that is a complete stranger to you, but you feel an instant affinity. And I think, again, that has to do with uh, feeling like the person is like family to you. I moved from Cape Verde to Bridgeport, Connecticut. I left Bridgeport and moved to Dorchester. So then I moved with my aunt, Maria, finished high school. It was a fantastic place to be because I that's uh, that's where I got introduced to theater. When I uh, left Boston, Massachusetts, I drove cross country, went to Hermosa Beach because that's where my cousin lived, and I stayed with him for about a month, a month and a half, before I got my own apartment in Hollywood. And, uh, I came to uh, Southern California in 1957. As a youngster, 11 and 12 years old, myself and my cousin Joanne and. Beverly, Sylvia, we were going to roller skate to California. Many years later though, we actually bought a Greyhound bus from Boston, Massachusetts and headed out to Los Angeles. Uh, soon afterwards, Abel Barboza and Joey Tavares followed us and that was our Cape Verdean community. And when I get there, I, I yelled to my mind that I, can, I can have a chance to go. And the ship was, it didn't, it didn't anchor. He was outside of the port, back and forth, back and forth. And uh, right away, they get together, the neighbors coming in, we had a little, little trunk, small one, and they put, put everything, all my clothes, and he told the guy, since I had no experience, I don't know the language, that he would pay me $20 a month to help the cook in the, in the galley. And uh, right away he says, oh, no, no. And I, I understood because he told me what the captain said. I says, tell the captain that I will go for free. <laughs> and the captain, he laughed. You know. He says, you get the job. I haven't been in Tony Grove since I was a baby. Then I went to Lisbon. Uh, Lisbon, I went to Europe, Africa, sponsored by the government, uh, in the United States in 1965. And I have many years since then. I came to the United States to sing and play in college universities, and I came in a cultural exchange. That's why I came to uh, to California. I, I had an uncle here, Manuel Silva. Those days were easy to stay here. I only knew four people in Los Angeles at the time, and I went and called in my family network to say that I'm going there, you know, are there any Cape Verdeans? I arrived on a Friday, and the very first thing I did was uh, go to this Cape Verdean barbecue. I met wonderful people in the Cape Verdean community, and I had a little notebook with me, and I was just taking everyone's name down and getting phone numbers, because I mentioned I only knew four people beyond the two people that hired me to come to LA. I came to Los Angeles in 1961, because that's where my husband-to-be had just got out of the military and stated he wasn't coming back to the East Coast anymore and that this is where he was going to, Los Angeles is where he was going to be making his uh, home. And he had just gotten a job that his uncle Ferris Singleton, they uh, welcomed me with open arms when I came here. 
Oh, I've always wanted to come out to California. When I was in the stores, I used to come out here and visit with my brother and my sister. So after I was discharged from the service, I spent one year back east. I arrived out here on a Sunday, and Monday I was working. Fortunately, for I had a brother that was a good, was a good certified welder, and that's what the company he was working for needed. And he certified and got them a, a government contract, so he could do almost anything, and they would. When I came to UCLA and kind of met up with some of my other Cape Verdeans who I knew from, ironically, going to school at Massachusetts College of Art at Mass Art, Nancy Baptiste and uh, Gail Hendricks, and I knew them through my association as art students, uh, and we also made the connection that we were also of Cape Verdean ancestry, which gave us sort of a little bond and connection in the fact that we were also migrated from Boston to Southern California, specifically Los Angeles area. So that gave us a sense of community right there, just among us, our small little nucleus. And then from there, Nancy and Gail put me in touch with the broader Cape Verdean diaspora or community that was in Southern California. But throughout the centuries, we've always been connected through our network of kinship. Part of what's happening with this trend of telling our story is so exciting is for the first time, different pockets of the diaspora are getting to learn about the other ones. We always knew about each other through the cousin network. Antonio established residence in Alameda, and there he was finally joined by his wife who sailed from Cape Verde in May of 1921. Pioneers like Antonio and Maria paved the way for many more Cape Verdeans looking to make California their home. For generations throughout the state of California, Cape Verdeans continue to get together as friends, as family, as Cape Verdeans sharing their common bond. These informal get-togethers kept Cape Verdeans united in a way which marks not only their niche for survival, but also their tenacity to thrive. 20 Grand Club was a bunch of old timers that started a club up to, amongst the Creoles and stuff, to keep our culture alive and to keep things going. And they threw dances, they threw benefits. And that, was our, that was our Creole club, that was the CV club. The old timers always managed to keep us kids together. Well, they'd meet at this person's house, that person's house. We used to be a uh, hall, ODS hall. It used to be between 5th and 6th on W Street. And that was where they threw all the Creole dances. Everybody Creole that came out here played at the ODS club. An attempt was made to count the number of Cape Verdeans in a 2000 census. This resulted in a speculated undercount by the community, as many Cape Verdeans are known to classify themselves as Portuguese, African American, or Latino. Outside of the New England area, California represents the second largest region in the United States that has become known as the home of the recently arrived and American-born Cape Verdeans. Cape Verdean organizations have been in existence in California throughout the past century. They've been instrumental in helping Cape Verdeans who have ventured to the Golden State from around the globe stay connected to their community, news, music, and current affairs. The most pressing mandate of the collective is to perpetuate its emerging racially and linguistically diverse culture into California's 21st century keeping alive the proud legacy of their rich heritage and culture. To date, there are three active nonprofit Cape Verdean organizations in the state of California, as well as a growing presence from San Diego. The Cape Verdeans of Southern California in Los Angeles, the Cape Verdean West Association in Oakland, San Francisco Bay Area, and the Sociedad de Cabo Verdeanes do Norte de California in West Sacramento. Consequently, these California-based organizations are a common thread that hold California Cape Verdeans together nationally and internationally. Each of these organizations promote their unique culture through its numerous social and educational functions. I had the opportunity to meet with uh, all the leaders of the different organizations of the Cape Verdean community, exchanging ideas, not only on their work here, but also on how can we 
partner, we uh, at the Embassy of Cape Verde uh, in Washington DC and themselves in order to uh, push forward the goals that we think are very similar and very common. So what I can say from what I have seen is that this organization has been working a lot, have done a very great job, and they had had outstanding achievements in different fields. And this is a, a very good sign that they are committed. They are committed not only in uh, enhancing the unity of Cape Verdeans here in, in the South California, but also in reaching out to other communities so that we can create what we want uh, a greater unity of the Cape Verdean nation in general. For the first few years I was here, there was this organization of men only called the Gentlemen's Club. We had a softball and a basketball team and we played in the area and we did most of our outings with the Cape Verdeans in Alameda. In 1978 uh, was the birth of the Cape Verdean West Association and that was an offshoot of all the Cape Verdeans from the East Coast who decided to get together and form an organization, and we were primarily men at that time also. The 1978 was the, the founding year of the Cape Verdean West Association in Oakland. Here in California, I moved to California in 1976. And I lived here, you know, for, for, for at least, you know, nine years. I didn't know about our association, the, the Cape Verdean West Association. I don't remember quietly, I can't recall oh, who invited me to that association. For some reason, they invite me, I came over there, I want to be involved with Cabo Verdean. When I see what they do there, their foundation and their principles, what they do at association, attract me because our basic here in our association is helping give a hand to those immediates. We gave money to different organizations in the Cape Verde Islands, especially the schools. We helped them one school for the plumbing, then we help build a school room, and we continually send money to different schools in different islands each year. I remember the first school that we assisted in was in Scala de Juvenal. They wanted me to do some trade work, but they had no tools at all. So we got together some money, and there was a Cape Verdean fellow we knew in New Bedford that had a lumber yard, and so we arranged with him to get all the skill saws, all the, all the tools that we needed, that the school needed, to send to the islands. And then the, the ambassador arranged to have it thrown out in uh, Cape Verde Airlines. So after that success, we were very proud of ourselves, ourselves at that time. We started just figuring out other ways to help the schools. And right now, we, we presently help six schools in about four of the islands. A lot of our members are getting older, so we are looking for younger members to keep the Cape Verdean West Association going so that we can continue to be active in some of the things that we've done in the past 34 years. To join the club, basically, all you have to do is fill out an application. Uh, you don't have to be a Cape Verdean. You just have to be interested in the Cape Verdean culture and wanting to learn and socialize with us. Come to our meetings, give us suggestions on what we should be doing next, help us in doing these things so that the same people are not doing the same things over and over again, bring new ideas to our club and get us going in the right direction. But well, we, we just give you a little glimpse of what we've done and essentially it's been to promote Cape Verde and to promote this organization so that if you come to California, you, you'll email us or you call us up because we're, we're your connection in, 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 in the Southern California. In the early 80s, uh, probably late 80, 81, about uh, looking at the possibility of, of organizing a Cape Verdean club in Southern California. Uh, and we spent a year just discussing that, and uh, that's, that was the beginning stages of, of CVSC, which was actually uh, officially uh, founded October of 82. There would be people like Walter Gomes that, you know, once you meet a Cape Verdean, you want to stick with that click, so to speak, so you can keep meeting more of your own people. And that's basically what happened, and it started growing with more Cape Verdeans coming in and, and you know, functions were being held. Walter Gomes would have, um, you know, functions over at his house. Um, I would have people over at my house and cook up some conja right away, you know, real quick and what have you. Everybody did everything to try to keep us together. 
The early days of CVSC was 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 something for me because I was missing my my Cape Verdean roots. So this brought me, you know, with other Cape Verdeans, uh, uh, you know, we were able to share our interests and uh, our interest in the culture, our interest in the music, and soon afterwards, you know, we we traveled to Cape Verde. And of course, this even instilled, you know, a, a deeper understanding and love for our culture. Uh, the Cape Verdeans of Southern California have been very effective with the newsletter that we had, telling people about what it is that we are so that their children know what it's about. The organization has its challenges because there are so few of us here, but yet and still, all across America, in Cape Verde, People look at the Cape Burns of Southern California, they just can't believe that so few people do so much. We have uh, exposed our culture to uh, a community that didn't know we existed and didn't know very much about us. And so through our dances and social events and through our picnics and, and more importantly some of, through some of our cultural activities, uh, there are a tremendous amount of more people that know about us, and, and that's very important. Uh, and then the other thing is, is what we're doing to expose our own people to our culture, because unfortunately, we're somewhat isolated from the broader group of Cape Verdeans in the East Coast, there's so many of them, and, and so many of us have left families behind that we've, uh, we've exposed our culture and, and increased the knowledge of our own Cape Verdean people. And that's important. And we've also created a bond uh, while we have family back in the eastern part and other parts of the country. We've created family out here. We, we socialize together and, and our children have grown up with uh, other, other children that are members. And, and uh, therefore, we, we are continuing uh, to promote our culture in that way. The club has been there to let the Cape Verdeans in Southern California express that and bring other Cape Verdeans in so that they have a place to experience and express and participate in their own culture. We wanted to do more. Although there are a lot of Cape Verdean organizations back east that were doing things for the Cape Verde Islands, but we wanted to do something a little bit more than that. Since 1985, we started with uh, the Juvenile Center dos, dos Centro uh, Dos Picos, but now we are supporting a blind school. We're supporting two other schools, one in Boya Vishnu, one in, the, one in Matagan in Brava. I would like for us to continue that humanitarian aspect of it because that's very important. For the past several years with Cape Verdeans of San Diego, uh, we've come together as far as having picnics, dances. We're trying to get to uh, bring and extend the community down here, which there are a lot of, but we just need to be more consistent in getting them to come to more events. It's a process, but I think it's gonna, it's gonna build even more. The mission for the San Diego Cape Verdeans is uh, to, to build a stronghold and to keep our community together. We've had a lot of people come from all over California. Everything that we're doing, uh, whether it be here in San Diego, Los Angeles, Northern California, all should be targeted towards the children. Uh, to, to show our children uh, the values that we grew up with. I want my children to learn the culture of Cape Verde uh, more than I even got to know it. I was raised w within the language but didn't know the language. I want them to know the language. I want them to go to Cape Bird and just be proud Cape Birding. Our whole thing is to enhance the Cape Birding culture. We give out scholarships, two scholarships a year. I started a um, golf tournament to support this scholarship and we're starting our third year coming up. First year we had 25 big golfers. Next year we had 40, and this year we had about 48. And now I've got some contacts, so we're probably gonna have about six to 100 golfers. It'll be a lot of fun. And what we do is that we don't give golf prizes. We give prizes like, my sister-in-law loves to make things. She made last year 30 baskets. And we gave those all prizes and the guys were just loving it. Uh, one guy bought 60 bucks worth of tickets so he can win at least one basket. 
he won four. Uh, and we had it, and then we served them. They have Jagasila, they have Manchupa, they have Cons, they have Buffons, and they love it. They love the food, and we just have a great time. We take pictures of them winning. Uh, we give, I give out, um, I think about 11 different trophies for the best score and the um, best team and so forth and so on. And so it's a real good golf tournament, and our, our goal is to you know, have a lot of more golfers and to increase the scholarship. We're only giving two for $500 scholarships, and we're considering going to give more, branching out with our scholarship program and other programs that we're putting on for the kids. We recognize that they're our future. The scholarship initiative adopted by these nonprofit organizations was designed to help students with their college education. These bright young stars have gone on to study such fields as medicine, law, engineering, business, communications, and journalism. Their efforts have been recognized by high schools, colleges, and universities nationwide. These young leaders are a source of great pride in the Cape Verdean community. Every summer, I would go to the Boston Center for the Arts and perform there um, with some university students and Clark University alumni. So I also perform at the Wang Theater, so I was always performing. I knew the importance of roots. Once I learned my roots, I was able to survive. I was able to have meaning and purpose in my life. I was able to make it through Harvard. The first Cape Verdean to graduate from Radcliffe was someone whose name I had heard as I was growing up, and a couple of cousins who had gone to college before me, and that made a difference for me, thinking I could do it in the, in the 70s. Um, and then came out to Stanford uh, in 76 to get my PhD. Taught at uh, a couple of institutions before coming here, one at Rutgers University in New Jersey, um, University of Illinois in Champaign-Urbana. Being Cape Verdean has really shaped my career path, and I, uh, I will, I will tell you that that certainly here in the community that I grew up in, uh, with my grandparents, parents, friends, and neighbors, uh, there was a sense of, uh, even though it wasn't expressed this way at the time, a sense of vision, vision about the future, and the way to achieve that vision, certainly in that community, was through hard work, and. Uh, there was a work ethic in that community that was second to none. So it has affected me in a, in a, in a huge way. They have a different currency than we had or our parents had. It's not labor, it's academics. We have made the step forward to become global citizens. Our children are global citizens. They're Cape Verdean, but they might be many other things, but they still have a reference point of being Cape Verdean. Their tools of interpreting and unpacking that isn't going to be working in the factory. It's going to be in terms of academic, professional engagement with the story. We're setting the foundation for the discourse to be carried on to the next generation who are going to be stewards of that legacy, but in a whole different context. Those of us who are second, I'm second generation, and those coming afterwards, we have benefited from the labor of our parents in the cranberry bogs, in the factories, and on the waterfronts. That's given us the skills to become PhDs, lawyers, doctors, filmmakers, writers, specialists in the new 21st century. I think our challenge and our obligation um, for a community and a culture that we're still connected to requires that we take the leadership in being the stewards of our culture in the 21st century. Without controlling your history, without controlling your memory, you have no future. We are in a unique but also precarious position uh, because the 21st century is about the new territory, which is cultural history and memory. I want to use uh, my success to help others because I've been helped before and I want the same opportunity to help other people, help my community. I'm proud to be Cape Verdean for so many reasons. Like uh, us as a people, Cape Verdean, we've gone through colonialism, we've gone through droughts, we've gone through poverty and still we rise as a people and we keep making strides and that's why I'm so proud to be Cape Verdean. People are bound by their cultures. 
by their traditions, by their customs and their beliefs, whether social, political or religious. Cultural pride offers an emotional reward as well. That sense of belonging to something bigger than yourself, knowing that you're a part of history that was here before you and will be there after you're gone. A legacy, something that has been handed down from a previous generation. Cape Verdean Americans have a legacy, and now, more than ever, their traditions and customs will play an important part of keeping that legacy alive. Cape Verdean culture thrives because the process of preservation is one which modifies, moves, changes like any living thing. Who doesn't remember Sundays at Grandma's house when she made that big pot of cachupa and gave you the first taste? Or your parents dragging you to that Cape Verdean dance where you ended up having the time of your life? Or finding out you were named after a relative called Nunu, Tilly, or Bobo? Whatever the case may be, every time you eat that meal or hear those songs, you'll forever be flooded with memories of your past. These memories remind you of who you are and where you came from. One would be hard pressed to forget the memories of your parents, grandparents, and so forth. When your children ask you who they are, and whatever your answer is, Greek, African, Irish, Italian, Jewish, or Cape Verdean. Stand tall and be firm with your answer. Your ancestors gave you something to be proud of. Now it's your turn to give them something to be proud of. The concept of being proud to be Cape Verdean, um, when I asked someone, I said, what do you mean to be proud to be Cape Verdean, and he said, it, it's, it, it, I'm proud to uh, have the values, to have the beliefs that my parents gave me, and to act in a way that makes people see them and be proud of being Cape Verdean. very proud to be Cape Verdean. I am proud to be Cape Verdean because we are God's children. I am proud to be a Cape Verdean. I am proud to be Cape Verdean. I am proud to be Cape Verdean. I am proud to be Cape Verdean. I am very proud to be a Cape Verdean. I'm proud to be Cape Verdean. I am proud to be Cape Verdean. I'm proud to be Cape Verdean. I'm proud to be a Cape Verdean. I'm proud to be Cape Verdean. I'm proud to be Cape Verdean. I'm proud to be Cape Verdean. We're proud to be Cape Verdean. I'm proud to be Cape Verdean. I'm proud to be Cape Verdean. I'm proud to be Cape Verdean. I am proud to be Cape Verdean. I'm proud to be Cape Verdean. I am proud to be Cape Verdean. And man, am I proud to be Cape Verdean. Gobble Verd represent. I'm proud to be Cape Verdean. I am proud to be Cape Verdean. I'm proud to be Cape Verdean. I am extremely proud to be a Cape Verdean. We're proud to be Cape Verdean! I'm proud to be a Cape Verdean. I'm proud to be 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 Cape Verdean. I'm very proud to be Cape Verdean. I'm proud to be Cape Verdean. I am proud to be a Cape Verdean. I'm proud to be Cape Verdean. I'm proud to be a Cape Verdean. It's my people's. <laughs> I'm proud to be a Cape Verdean. I'm proud to be a Cape Verdean. I'm proud to be Cape Verdean. I'm proud to be a Cape Verdean. I'm proud to be Cape Verdean. I'm proud to be Cape Verdean. I'm proud to be Cape Verdean.
so sabi, 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 so sabi. I'm very proud to be a Cape Verdean. Okay? Good. Thank you. Let's go eat. Good. I'm good.